Welcome to Scale Model Workshop and the second half of the PT-489 construction video. The later series Elko boats were the first to be built with the 40mm in place. However, the mount and location of the gun, along with the details of the engine hatch, were different from those supplied in the kit. This image of PT-490 is a good illustration. Looking up close, it was clear that the engine hatch needed significant modifications. The narrower ventilator, storage boxes, and 40mm storage were pretty much the same as seen on the later 43 boats. Rather than modify and clean up the kit hatch, I started by cutting a new one from acrylic and styrene sheet. The new 40mm storage cabinet was fabricated from sheet styrene over a wood block. I sectioned out the center of the kit's main engine ventilator. The sides and back were sheathed with 10,000 styrene to form a recess for the photo etched grill. Here's a rough comparison against the stock hatch. The new storage boxes were made up using the same technique of sheet styrene over a wood block. The bases for the other two ventilators were machined from acrylic. In reality, the deck of the engine hatch should follow the camber of the main deck and not be flat like the kit hatch. If I were doing it again, I'd build that in. Here's the finished hatch. The last significant modification involved the mount for the 40mm. The earlier mount was located further forward, resulting in pretty much no overhang of the barrel. It also appeared to be lighter in construction and not nearly as tall as the later mount. The base of the gun sits slightly higher than the engine hatch. I replaced the kit mount with a modified spare 37mm mount in the more forward location. Typically there seemed to be no railings around the back of the earlier installations of the 40mm. This makes construction a little simpler, but you'll still need to fix the issue with the trunnion width and the sinkhole in the receiver, as I showed in part 2 of the review. One issue that I didn't address in the review is the poor fit between the trunnion and the base. This large gap is the result of the uneven surface formed on the underside of the trunnion and the undulations in the poorly molded surface of the base. I found the following method to be the most efficient solution. The trunnion halves are first cemented together. Cement's only applied to these two contact areas. Paper clip clamps are used to maintain the alignment. Remove the bulk of the molded pin. For future reference, mark the center point and drill a pilot hole. Level off the surface by first scraping off the gross irregularities and then finish off the surface against the sandpaper block. Drill a shallow 332nds hole and cement in a piece of 332nds styrene tube. Trace the outline of the trunnion on the base and use a blade to reduce the raised areas until the two pieces meet up squarely. Once cemented together, the gun can then be snapped into place. Location of the smoke generator and whether or not depth charges were carried varied from boat to boat. Lacking specific information about PT-489, I decided to go with the configuration of PT-490. While blacked out in the instructions, the depth charges are included in the kit because Spruce sees the same in both the PT-579 and the 109 kits. Unfortunately, the kit's representation of the depth charges and rack are less than state-of-the-art. Here's what you can expect with what I would consider a normal amount of time for cleanup and adjustment. For reference, this is an actual depth charge in a Type-C release rack. Rather than fitting, filling, and trying to keep them round, I found it easier and faster to turn some new depth charges from acrylic rod. The racks were then given a rework. And I also made up a new smoke generator. The kit torpedoes go together pretty well but the result has that same thick, vintage plastic look. Since this is after all a torpedo boat, I thought I would devote a little more effort to put forth a better representation. Like the depth charges, it was easier to just start from scratch. Brass tubing was used for the center with acrylic rod for the nose and tail. The acrylic was shaped on the lathe using a file and sandpaper. 
Slots were cut for the fins that were shaped from 5,000 brass shim. Two rows of 0.3 millimeter holes were drilled. In reality, these should be slotted, but I don't have a mill that small. The nose piece was machined from brass. Here are the basic torpedoes and primer. Because of the scale, I knew from the beginning the bugger was going to be the props. What's supplied in the kit are abysmal. I first thought I could make do by modifying some screws from a 1700 ship kit, but plastic has its limitations and they looked overly thick and out of character alongside the 5000's fins. In the end I made up some props from brass. While far from perfect, I think they're a more effective representation, especially since the blades are the same thickness as the fins. The torpedo racks are made up of three parts that lack a precise fit. The assembled racks are located on the deck with pins. This combination inevitably results in gaps around the rack as well as the locating holes being partly visible. To eliminate these issues, the rack frame, part N152, was placed on the deck and a piece of 30,000 styrene strip was cemented to the deck as shown. The styrene strip maintains a positive location so that the pins can be removed and the holes in the deck can be filled. The racks then assembled and the bottom sanded flat. I added some brackets to affix the cables that are used to secure the torpedoes in the racks. The torpedoes were first painted with Mr. Color Super Metallic II stainless steel reduced with Mr. Color leveling thinner. The surface of the torpedoes was burnished with graphite and black smoke pigment to deepen the color. I used a custom-built spring-loaded scribe to cut the separations into the painted surface. The torpedoes were finally mounted in the racks with 4,000th fishing line. Other than the 40 millimeter, the type of mount and location of the rest of the automatic weapons carried on a PT varied from boat to boat, but typically there was a certain amount of commonality within each squadron. The single 20 millimeter supplied in the kits in the right location, but the representation of the heavy mounts not very well done. A new mount was fashioned from styrene stock. The RON-33 boats mounted the 37mm more forward than the kit. A gun was typically mounted along each side of the chart house. Most of the time these seemed to be 20mm or a twin 50, but sometimes what was known as an AC Ducey was used. The AC Ducey consisted of a 20mm mounted between two 50s. The mounts for the additional guns as well as the more forward 37mm were this lightweight type. These were fabricated from styrene and brass. Here are the finished mounts. The kit 37mm magazine was given a makeover and I explained the process in part 2 of the kit review. From this image it appears that the 489 boat retained the twin 50s in the gun tubs. I think any way you look at it. Injection molding the framework for this mount in this small of a scale is extremely difficult. I give Ravel credit for trying, but their mold cutting technology wasn't up to their design, so it needed a fair amount of surgical cleanup. As I mentioned in the review, the mount's very fragile, and I strongly suggest that you remove it from the sprue with as little trauma as possible. 
Here you can see how the gates have completely filled in these areas. The only solid section of the frame was clamped in a hand vise and the excess gate material was removed from the front post. The frame was cemented to the base of the mount and I set about removing the gate material and developing some relief between the frame and the guide for the ammo feed. Along the way doing a bit of filling and build up with thin layers of Zappa Gap. The actual mount also has some additional bracing. I added the two most prominent with 20,000th styrene rod. Rather than trying to fit a freestanding piece, I found it much easier to mark the location on the ring, drill a hole, and simply insert the rod through the hole. The oversized molded barrels of the twin 50s make them look chunky and stubby. In addition, you can see in this image of PT-489 that the barrels were fitted with flash hiders. The barrels were replaced with 28,000th brass wire and the flash hiders were machined from brass rod. The flash hiders were sweat soldered in place using resistance soldering. Resistance soldering is extremely fast, clean, and precise. If you're interested in knowing more about resistance soldering, I highly recommend this video from David Brandreth. I put the link to the video in the description below. Here's everything all up compared to the stock assembly. The 489 photo also reveals what looks like a twin 30 mount on the port bridge wing, and more than likely there was an additional weapon on the starboard wing as well. I'm not sure how effective these were, and it seems like they could be more dangerous to the crew than the enemy. I elected to omit these. However, I did fabricate the siren. The antenna for the VHF receiver transmitter on this group of boats was located on the forward port side of the chart house. I used this simple jig to fashion a new antenna using 16,000th nichrome wire for the mast and 7,000th brass wire for the array. I prefer nichrome wire for small diameter antenna masts like these because it's straight and it's not easily bent if bumped, but you can't solder to it so I attached the array with cyanoacrylate. A new spotlight was fabricated from brass.
The life rafts carried on the later PT boats were fabricated from balsa wrapped with canvas strips. These rafts came from a variety of manufacturers and varied in details. A good example of one type can be seen in the video tour of PT-658. The life raft in the kit's pretty basic and it's designed to mount over the chart house. I wanted to add some detail and relocate it over the day cabin. I started by cutting out the floor and sanding away the raised detail. 3 aught silk suture was run around the outside and held in place with strips cut from Tamiya tape. Everything was fixed in place with a generous coat of red acrylic lacquer automotive primer. This is the typical camouflage pattern used on the RON 33 boats. From the beginning of this project, my inspiration for the color and tone was this magnificent model by Stu Hurley. The model is a modification of the 35th scale Italeri kit. You can see additional images of Stu's beautiful build on the PT103.com website and the PT forum board. For paint, I used various mixes of Tamiya acrylics. The base color for the deck and hull were applied with an Iwata LPH-80. Note that the model's not been primed. As I explained in my last two airbrushing videos, the LPH-80 allows me to apply a thin wet coat over a large area. I found that when applied this way, the Tamiya acrylic, thinned only with lacquer thinner, has very good adhesion, so I no longer routinely prime everything. This is important for minimizing material buildup in order to preserve the sharpness of the various details, as I discussed in the video, the shadow nose. The camouflage pattern was cut from Aura Mask Vinyl. To soften the color demarcation slightly, I raised the edge of the mask with thread. If you want to try this technique, don't just go blasting away. You should be a slight bit behind the edge or directly over the edge. If you're in front, you'll get material under the mask with a spray ending at the thread. The result's this hard line shadow effect. To be safe, you can paint the edges, remove the mask, and then fill in the central portion. Here's the upper portion of the hull. Another advantage to having the model mounted on the base is that it's much easier to mark the waterline, which is especially challenging on the Elko hull. Here I'm using a surface gauge. The lower portion of the Elko hulls were painted with a proprietary coating known as Copperoid. I used a base coat of Tamiya Hull Red, oversprayed here and there with a lighter color mixed with Tamiya Red Brown, and then a medium stipple of thin Napa Red Oxide Primer. The camouflage and Copperoid should carry over to the mufflers as well. The metalwork on the underside of the hull was done in manganese bronze. Manganese bronze isn't really a bronze, but actually a type of brass. If you look online, you can get an idea of the color of cast manganese bronze. There seems to be anecdotal evidence that it was mostly left unpainted. I used a mix of Tester's chrome silver and some gold leaf enamel paint, oversprayed with Tester's dull coat, and then tinted with a wash of Vallejo bronze. The upper deck structures were painted and the markings were applied with decals. The star and bars were taken off of a sheet from an old Revell B-25 kit. At the time of this photo, it appeared that the chart house numbering on the 49 boat had been redone in white, shadow shaded with red. It was the reverse of these other two boats in the squadron. I couldn't come up with a suitable, readily available source, so I went with the simpler white numbering used by many of the other boats in the squadron. The white numbers came from an old microscale sheet. To minimize the buildup of material, the decals were applied directly onto the paint. I explained this technique in my video on decals. All the deck structures were given a coat of dull coat, and the white was slightly dulled down with a mist of a dilute mix of OD and medium gray. The horizontal surfaces got a light dusting with pastels. Except for the 40 millimeter, all the automatic weapons were painted with a very dark gray and then burnished with powdered graphite. So all in all, after fabricating a few bits and some fiddling around, 
the kit proved to be a reasonable starting point for an attractive bookshelf model. I hope you enjoyed this video, and perhaps it's given you a few ideas when building your own projects. So long for now, and I'll see you next time. Let's drag our tails out of here!